Hi, I'm April Rome, and I welcome you to Meet My Hero series. This next hero is incredibly transformational in her own right. She is the eldest daughter of the Perrin family, which many of you may know is the family that the original Conjuring movie is based on. Andrea is the author of House of Darkness, House of Light trilogy, in which she writes about her own personal experiences in the farmhouse. I invite you to sit back and take in some of the words of wisdom that this beautiful light leader is going to be sharing with each of us. Welcome to my hero series, and I'm grateful to be able to hold this space for you, my beautiful Andrea Perrin. Souls, we're in this in human form, which is why I think that this meeting well, even you and I meeting and being thrown in the world's oldest kitchen <laughs> with roaches. Um, but my God, it was amazing. It's divine. So thank you for spending some time with me this afternoon. Oh, it's my pleasure, sweetheart. You are one of the people in my life who is an inspiration to me. Um, you know, you immediately touched my heart. I mean, immediately it was... From the moment we met, the connection was so strong and so pure and so ancient that I knew we'd been a around the universe together before. And, um, and so it was, uh, it was a, a reunion for me, um, even though it was the first time that I was encountering you on this plane of action. I wandered I wandered around this friggin' planet for decades going, why am I here? What is this for? This looks strange. This isn't home. Um, you know, what is it? And I mean, like literally wandered this, this planet for decades of my life. And it wasn't until I wrote our story that, you know, that I found the, personal courage to not give a damn how anybody received it but to just put it out into the world and see what came of it mm. um that all these miraculous people came into my life and you are right there at the top of the list um i can't explain it i don't even know if i want to explain it um uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it's just, it's wondrous. It's the first time for the last 10 years, I published my first book 10 years ago in March, March 11th of 20, uh, 2011. And um, figures that it was 11, 11, you know, figures. But um, it, uh, it utterly, completely changed my life. And I didn't know, honestly, if there would even be anybody out there that wanted to read it. Um, I knew at that point that there was a movie, sorta kinda, in the works, based on the case files of Ed and Lorraine Warren. But to me, that was um, not even an essential part of what I was doing. I was writing the truth uh, from you know every member of my family, uh, I interviewed all of them to the point of like ad nauseum to make sure that I had every story right, every encounter correct, everything um, proper. Your sister has gotten all dressed up for this today. <laughs> in black and it's not morning it's like it's a good dress it like really and it, what's funny is it's not um there's no shoulders but it's the kind that kind of comes up and goes around the neck it's really cute it's black but it's almost like she's adjusting her microphone um, this is why she's clearing her throat like almost like she's been part of the light journey this whole time she has and 
and you're the voice box and she's the heart. Which, um, just to please understand she's here. I'd love to ignore that, but she is a part of you. And more than anything, she needs you to know that she's very supportive of what you're doing now, even though it is, she says, extraordinary. It is. And uh, she probably stole that dress from me. Not for nothing, but she probably did. Um, and uh, she, she was great about, you know, can I borrow this? And then me not seeing it again for a very long time. And then having to jump her, you know, like, like you know, could I please have my dress back? I sort of kind of need it. I've got to go back on the road. Um, and uh, yeah, we had a few falls. She, she would lose stuff all the time. I don't know how she did. The last one she borrowed... Um, she couldn't find it, couldn't find it. It was one of my favorites. And, you know, I was really bent out of shape with her. So she went shopping and bought me a half a dozen other dresses to tide me over until she found it, which she found on the bottom of the floor of her closet where I had fallen off of a hanger. And I said, April, it's pink. It's like pink and rose and bright colors how can you not find it how can you lose something that's that colorful you know she finally showed up with it and i was grateful and then i felt really bad about giving her a hard time about it yeah so i gave her a really hard time about it which is one of the things that i feel guilty about now you know anybody that says they have no regrets <laughs> is not being honest with themselves or with the universe I think that I think that all of us, all of us have something that we can look back on and wish that we could change. April was a difficult personality and there were times that I treated strangers better than I treated my own baby sister. What I ask for is her forgiveness and I would do anything anything to change that now and I can't but I just want her to forgive me for being flawed and being human because I'm better than that and I love her with every fiber of my being I love her and I feel her right now. I feel her around me. I feel her hand she's on my shoulder. Up. She's looking at me and she says, because the name, we share the name. So she says, April, I say April. But she says, April, she promised me she wasn't going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is not fair, Annie. You promised me you weren't going to okay. do it. Okay, well, you know, so as not to destroy the makeup I just put on for this uh, <clears throat> Zoom session. Yes. I will um, I will pull it together. And yes, I always promise her that I won't cry. <laughs> um, you know, I because I can cry, honest to God. Uh, a dog food commercial can make me cry. Um, taking some notes. Okay, my Libra. First of all, my daughter's Libra. So, such a powerful force. Um, very heart driven. Very compassion driven. Passion driven. Uh, but what I thought was very interesting. So, life path number seven. I don't do numerology, but seven angel numbers. Um, and I think I'm a seven, which is odd. Uh, your air. So, as I'm taking these notes, I'm like, this, this is Andrea. Communicate without barriers. Prefers face to face. Yes, because it's going to be heart to heart. This is where the, the, the memory happens. The magic always searching for new information always searching Seeing your zodiac animals is the dog yes which is yang earth energy so that's going to balance you thank you princess buttercup um yes she's right here there she is uh, is she there she heard me oh yes oh, oh yes she did the eyes are open she's looking up she's looking up 
princess. I miss you. Okay, here's what's really cool. Socrates was also a Libra. Yeah. No, you probably did tea with him a few times. Probably. Yeah, it was one of my favorites. I got a degree in philosophy, uh, uh, and particularly because of Socrates and Rene Descartes. Wow. This is what this interview was about. Andrea, you cannot not be Andrea. Yeah. Excels at teaching. I have watched you speak in many, many environments and every ear is up, every heart is open, and then every eye starts leaking. Um, <laughs> on the day you were born, Friday, Mercury was in your sign. It literally, Mercury, so Mercury, where we're in retrograde now, but Mercury being the uh, communication planet, but Venus was also in your sign, love. Yes. So, you know, I'm reading all of this and it's like, you were born to be you. You're the best friends anybody ever had. People get so wrapped up in your light. We, we do. We get wrapped right up into your light. Um, I don't want people to miss out where you came from. Not that that is important, but technically in this lifetime, it's what has caught a lot of individuals' attention. And it technically, I know people are like, oh, it's dark stuff. No, it's actually where Andrea does her light work the best. Yeah, it is. And actually at the farm. You know, uh, one of the things that's so bizarre, I, I know a lot of, now that the house has been uh, repurchased uh, by people who are paranormal investigators who have decided to open it, um, to the public and, you know, let other investigative teams come through and do their own research and everything. I know a lot of these people. And so like Friday night, for instance, I got a call at 10 o'clock at night. I had given them permission to call me and um, the team was all in the house. They were all in place. Everything was set up and they called me and they put me on speakerphone and I greeted the spirits and activated the house for them. You know, I introduced them to the spirits and, you know, told them, you know, make sure you no know, nobody there does any kind of provoking, just talk to them um, and they will respond in kind. And while I was talking to them, they were filming. And I saw after the fact that all their gadgets were just going crazy. I mean, things that were completely away from human beings and that energy. Uh, there was a K2 meter sitting on the sofa. There was another thing sitting in the parlor. There was another thing in uh, the library that used to be my parents' bedroom. And all of these meters were just going off like crazy. It's and like you're, the trigger. you're the trigger. Yeah. Well, they know my voice. Yeah. And they know my intention. And I'm, you know, I'm like 16, 1700 miles away from them. But time and space is an illusion. It's, yes. you know, I'm right there. I mean, I was right there in the house with it was, them. It was like I had projected myself, uh, just astral projection, which is very easy for me to do. We are who we are on purpose. Spirit literally dropped you off at a, at a farm that was, uh, incredibly paranormally active is to this day, which is what you were saying. Um, and in talking about energy, energy is every, everywhere. It's, it's why we feel chemistry with certain people. It's why we pay attention to somebody we're placed in a kitchen with. We're like, oh, I know them. Uh, energy is everything. And you and I know it doesn't stop just with the physical body. The eldest of, was it five girls? Yes. Oh, I'm one of seven, so five girls though. Oh my God, there's three of us. No, uh, I'm one of seven too. And I was born on 1010 at 1010 AM. Interestingly, the executive producer of The Conjuring was also born at the exact day and, and time as I was. We literally came into the world at the same moment, same year, same time, same date. Okay, again, people go, what a coincidence. That's what a coincidence is. It's a God thing. Yeah. I mean, no accidente, no accident. 
family is the family that the movie, uh, the very first one, The Conjuring, is based on. House of Darkness, House of Light dot com, where you talk about the recording, the making of the movie, Hollywood versus your experience, and that's what I want to tie into, dive into. You being Andrew Perrin, the oldest, an intuitive, an empath, a born in uh, what? The, the 80s, correct? So, um... No, <laughs> the, the 50s, that's okay. 1958 was a very good year. It was very, very um, solitary for you, I can imagine. Your family moved into this beautiful old farmhouse. Gorgeous. Yeah, yeah I was 12 years old when we moved in. And uh, what happened? A normal family, love, from what I gathered, lots of love, five girls, my goodness. Uh, What happened? Everything changed. Everything changed. Uh, Within moments, you know, and it's so weird, April, you know, we, we visited the farm a number of times um, before we actually owned it. My mother found it when I was 11 years old. Um, it was in uh, June of 1970. And uh, then my parents, it, it took a lot to pull it all together. I mean, we went from, um, well, you know, my father was uh, not a blue collar worker. He was kind of a white collar worker, but he was, uh, uh, and he was in insurance. He sold freezers. He had, you know, he was um, doing well for that day and age. And to yeah, support- he was. We were middle class. Um, but when my mother found that farm, it really did change everything. And and uh, my father uh, loaded us up into the car to go up and look at it. Uh, I knew from the moment that I stepped onto the property, I knew from the moment we arrived in town, um, I recognized a town that our family had never been to. Um, I knew where everything was, but I knew where everything was from like 1700s or 1800s. I didn't recognize the stuff that had been built since then. Um, Yeah. How old? I was um, I was 11 years old, and then I turned 12 in October. My parents closed on the property in the beginning of December uh, of 1970, and then we moved in after Christmas. We moved in right after New Year's, actually, in 1971, um, and then stayed there until June of 1980. So, I mean, it really was like 10 years. Uh, especially for me, because from the moment that we arrived at the farm, I didn't want to leave it. I just wanted to stay there. I knew I was where I belonged, and I knew that it was home in a way that I had never felt home before, that sense of home and belonging. Um, You know, but it took another five months before we were actually living there. But in that time, we visited a number of times, but nothing unusual happened. While we were, I asked all my family members, had, the, had, did they have any recollection of seeing anything weird or strange or untoward? And everyone said, no, um, ghosts were not on the radar for us. They weren't. This was an original colonial home that was completed 40 years before the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Um, you know, it was... Uh, it was uh, just absolutely magical, and there was nothing comfortable about it. I mean, it was a clapboard house with no insulation, which means that for, oh, I don't know, maybe four months out of the year, it was a comfortable house to live in, and the rest of the time you were either frying or you were freezing. Um, oh my goodness. Yeah, it, it was uh, not a comfortable environment to live in. Um, But, you know, we were kids and we were resilient and you just make the best of it. And um, it was uh, the day that we moved in that I was the first one who saw a full body apparition, but he didn't appear as a spirit to me. Um, He looked absolutely solid, flesh and blood. 
And when I walked past him, I said, good morning, sir. Um, and he didn't respond to me. And I figured, you know, I'm a kid, you know, who am I to him? I didn't know who he was. I asked my mother and she said, you know, nobody's with Mr. Kenyon. He, um, his son's on the way, he's not here yet. So I guess I just assumed it was a neighbor that had stopped by to say goodbye. I remember thinking he was dressed oddly, but yeah. other than that, it didn't leave any impression on me. Nothing unusual. Like I could walk up and touch him. Um, I didn't realize that in those moments I was in an alternate dimension. I was with him. My sister Nancy saw him disappear before her eyes. Christine saw him, Cindy saw him, and Nancy saw him disappear. This month marks 51 years since your mom found the house. Yes. Yep. Kind of it was on January 11th that I posted that it's 50 years to wow. the day that we moved into the farm. 50 years to the day. What an amazing journey. What an absolutely amazing journey it has been. April, I learned everything in that 10 years. I learned everything that I needed to know about life and death and the afterlife. Um, it has, it freed me, it liberated me to live fearlessly because I don't have any fear of death. Um, I don't want to die a painful death, no one does. I'm not afraid to die because I know that it is merely the turning of a page. It is merely the next chapter. It is just a transformation like the butterfly that busts out of the chrysalis. Um, it's nothing for anyone to fear. And yet I find that that's what most people are haunted by. Haunts them in the wee hours when they're alone and thinking about their mortality. But what was it when you were not so versed in, in the universe and the cosmic plans? It was soul school. It prepared me for everything that came after. Um, it's what, um, it created my, my trajectory in life. Um, I went off to college in 1976 after graduating from high school. It was, I was miserable. I was like, oh my God, what have I done? You know, I was 666 miles door to door from my, I know, like a bad old. College was overall, it was a very good experience, but I missed the farm and I missed my family and I missed my spirits and I missed being home so much. And it was, uh, it was very difficult. Uh, for me to be away from home. I had a double major in English literature and philosophy. I mean, I read about 900 pages a week, um, you know, and wrote, I don't know how many papers and how many, oh my God, I literally rubbed the letters off of my typewriter in the four years that I was there. And now I have a computer where there are no letters. No, the Q is left, the W is left, there's a B. There's a G and there's a P. It was hard, you know, it was really hard. Uh, life was hard. I never knew, and I was never once attacked in the house. I never had 
a negative altercation with any of the spirits at all. Uh, not once, but it was hard watching what was happening to other members of my family. Um, Cindy in particular, <clears throat> and my mother. My sister Nancy saw him disappear before her eyes. Christine saw him, Cindy saw him, and Nancy saw him disappear. many environments and every ear is up every heart is open and then every eye starts leaking um 